on the 15th of July 2001, the paleontology documentary film When Dinosaurs Roamed America was released. Also known simply as When Dinosaurs Roamed in some regions, it was produced by Evergreen Films and originally aired on the Discovery Channel. Often considered a sort of American equivalent to the BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs, When Dinosaurs Roamed America similarly portrays the lives of extinct dinosaurs, showcasing their evolution from their humble beginnings in the Triassic period, their massive growth spurts in the Jurassic, to their eventual extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. Whilst it does sound, and oftentimes is, similar to Walking with Dinosaurs, there are key differences here that set it apart. One such thing being that it's narrated by John Goodman, possibly the most likeable man on the planet. And I have to say, he does a really good job of sounding very natural and enunciating appropriately for a documentary, and I applaud him for that. The biggest difference, however, would be that this documentary, given the name, focuses solely on fossil finds from the United States. As such, this opens a door of opportunity to showcase both different creatures and epochs that were not seen in Walking with Dinosaurs. Granted, there are quite a few that overlap, but there is of course only so much to choose from. The film starts with a brief teaser of what is to come throughout its runtime, with various scenes of CGI dinosaurs roaring and strutting their stuff. This is accompanied by a really awesome music piece that I find myself humming from time to time, composed by Christopher Frank. After the opening title sequence, we start in modern day New York, showing stock footage of New York City before transitioning to the greatly contrasting late Triassic New York. The narration explains how the world's continents were once combined as one supercontinent, Pangaea. However, as North America drifted from Africa, several basins were formed along what is now the North American East Coast. Over time, these basins filled with fresh water, becoming a group of prehistoric lakes now called the Newark Supergroup, named after Newark, New Jersey. We are treated to a really cool sight of volcanoes in the evening, before a narration explains that a supposed comet struck the Earth around 250 million years ago, sparking the Permian mass extinction. From this, life struck back and the reptiles evolved into a variety of forms, among them were the first dinosaurs. As such, we are introduced to our first CGI creature, the Coelophysis. Right off the bat, the similarities to Walking With are very apparent. Not only does this segment take place 220 million years ago, the exact same date as New Blood, the first episode of Walking With Dinosaurs, but the Coelophysis model here looks strikingly similar, with its green colour scheme and red and yellow details. It could just be a coincidence, but yeah, the similarities are quite apparent. The model itself is really detailed, but something about it just doesn't blend well with the background. It is nicely animated and very bird-like as it should be, but something about the textures just doesn't quite look right to me. It's also worth pointing out that we may have been spoiled by the effects of Walking With, as this film probably only had a fraction of the budget to work with. With that in mind, for a made-for-TV CGI dinosaur documentary made in the early 2000s, I'd say it looks really good. As for the model itself, this looks to be based on the species Coelophysis bauri, or bauri, more on that later. And aside from the pronated wrists, it looks really good for the time. However, nowadays it should have lips and possibly even feathers. It attacks and kills an unspecified mammal, live acted by an eastern quoll. The Triassic segment was filmed in gorgeous Tasmania, and we are treated to an awesome aerial shot of one of its lakes. It's when the Coelophysis goes for a drink at the lake's edge that we meet our next creature, and the first that did not appear in Walking with Dinosaurs, the Rutiodon. Rutiodon is a phytosaur, a group of archosaurs that evolved to superficially resemble modern crocodiles. As such, it lived very similarly, stalking the water's edge for unwary prey. Accuracy-wise, I honestly can't say there's really anything wrong with it, which is excellent. Its colour scheme is quite lacking, however. It's all just a dull brown, when I feel some camouflage similar to modern crocs may have gone a long way. Its interactions with the water also leave a lot to be desired. There's little to no splashes or ripples, and the creature's movements look quite choppy at times. Nevertheless, the swift Coelophysis evades its lunging attack from the lake. 
The narration then explains how, in the Triassic, reptiles have evolved to exploit the numerous niches left vacant by the Permian extinction. This has led to the evolution of many bizarre groups that perished at the end of the period. This is explained over some beautiful scenery of a group of Rutiodon basking by a river in the middle of a forest, being watched by a Coelophysis atop a waterfall. Boy, does that sound familiar. The Coelophysis wanders off and encounters an Icarosaurus, a strange gliding reptile with wings. The narration states it is the first reptile to do this, but the way Geltisaurids from the Permian, aka Rex from Primeval, probably mastered gliding first. After a brief chase, the Coelophysis gives up and searches for food elsewhere. After sneaking its head into the burrow of a Cynodont, that also sounds familiar, and comes out an angry Traversodont. They don't give a specific genus unfortunately, but what little we can make out, the model looks pretty accurate to me, though it is interesting that they used a live action mammal earlier, but a CGI model here. In the next scene we are introduced to the Desmatosuchus, and despite it sharing the Rutidon's dull monotone brown colour scheme, the model looks excellent. It's an Aetosaur, another bizarre group of reptiles only found in the Triassic. It's aged incredibly well and is one of the best looking models in the show in my opinion. We see the herbivore have a brief encounter with a Rutiodon, as the narration explains how its sprawling legs inhibits its speed. As such, the Desmatosuchus sees off the predator before encountering the puny looking Coelophysis. Considering Desmatosuchus was about 4.5 meters long and Coelophysis was around 3 meters long, the scale seems really off here. Regardless, it swings and misses the dinosaur with its tail before the small carnivore darts off. The Coelophysis then chases down and catches a locust before showcasing another distinguishing feature of this film, the X-ray scenes. These segments briefly break up the action to take a short but informative insight into the anatomy of certain animals, in this case Coelophysis. It details how Coelophysis is lightly built and therefore is very fast and agile. Its legs are positioned directly under the body, contrasting with the previously stated Rutiodon's drawback. Its neck is long, giving it a great field of view, and walking on two legs means it can use its forelimbs as hands. These segments are comprehensive and never outstay their welcome, and I really appreciate their inclusion. The narration then alludes to the efficient body plan of the dinosaurs, allowing them to inherit the Earth. It then goes on to explain how a meteor entered Earth's atmosphere towards the end of the Triassic and fragmented, striking multiple parts of the Earth, with each collision ejecting molten rock into the atmosphere. The following environmental fluxes mark the end of the Triassic and the start of the Jurassic. The Triassic segment concludes with another defining feature of the film, paleontological cutaways. These segments showcase real-life paleontologists describing fossil and geological evidence that supports the decisions made for the storylines portrayed in the film. This segment features paleontologist Dr. Paul E. Olson showing us the boundary between the Triassic and Jurassic rock layers, and that the large quantities of iridium found in said layer suggest a form of meteorite impact. Much like the X-ray segments, these are brief, informative, and comprehensive, and it's nice to see that the storytelling in the film is more than just wild speculation. As a whole, I really like this first segment in the Triassic. Whilst there were certainly parts that seemed to be taking a lot of inspiration from Walking with Dinosaurs, when it does its own thing, it's solid stuff. Based on the presence of both Rutiodon and Icarosaurus in New York, I'm going to assume this is meant to represent the Lokatong formation. As for the other creatures, whilst Desmatosuchus is not known from the formation, there are footprints attributed to Aetosaurs from here. Whether these were Desmatosuchus tracks, however, is unknown. Coelophysis is a similar deal, in that small theropod footprints are known from this formation, but Coelophysis itself wouldn't have evolved for another 4 million years after this segment setting. Lastly, even though the Traversodon isn't given a specific genus, there is no evidence of them living in New York specifically, but they are known from the East Coast, so it's possible some did live in this location. In conclusion, whilst there isn't much plot here, the Triassic segment is a strong start and it helps ease you into what is to come. The second segment takes place 200 million years ago in Pennsylvania during the early Jurassic, a time epoch we never saw in Walking with Dinosaurs, making this part wholly original, which is really cool to see. This segment appears to have been filmed in Tasmania, much like the Triassic segment, though I could be wrong. 
please let me know in the comments if you have any information on where this part was filmed. If it is indeed Tasmania, well it's not a bad choice necessarily. North America during the early Jurassic was overall quite arid, with much of the continent being a vast desert. Along the edges of this central desert, the climate would have been milder, but perhaps not to the extent of the rather tropical looking setting shown here. A more accurate environment would be conifer forests surrounded by sand, but it could just be that this takes place during the wet season. We are then introduced to the first animal of this segment, Syntarsis, and strap yourselves in because this animal's taxonomic history is quite confusing. When first discovered, this dinosaur was named Syntarsis kiantakete, however the name Syntarsis was already taken for a species of beetle. Its genus name was then changed to Megapnosaurus kiantakete, along with a specimen of Syntarsis, from the Elliott's formation in Africa to Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis. But it doesn't stop there. Both of these specimens have sometimes been considered early Jurassic species of Coelophysis. Even more recently, it's been determined that these three taxa may not even be that closely related at all. All this to say that calling this animal Syntarsis at the time was reasonable, but now is questionable to say the least. As for the actual model itself, it's essentially just the Coelophysis Bauri model from earlier, but with larger head crests and a mottled brown skin texture. It shares the same problems with the pronated wrists and lack of lips, but overall, I think this one looks nicer and blends better with the forest background. Unlike the solitary insect hunter of the Triassic, this pack of four is out hunting for dinosaurs. We are then introduced to the first herbivorous dinosaur in the film, Ankysaurus. I'm very happy basal sauropodomorphs are represented in media other than just Platyosaurus, as I feel this group can often be overlooked in favour of their more famous and massive later relatives. Despite having yet another brown colour scheme, the model itself looks really good and accurate. Aside from the fact it may be too large, here the animal is portrayed as being 6 meters long, whereas body fossils indicate Ankysaurus was only about 2 meters. However, there is evidence from trackways that they could have grown to the estimated 6 meter length showcased here. Much like the Platyosaurus from Walking with Dinosaurs, it is portrayed as a facultative biped, walking on all fours but standing on just two, similar to a hadrosaur. Whilst this method of locomotion is thought outdated for Platyosaurus, it may be more reasonable for Ankysaurus, as it is more derived and closer to the fully quadrupedal sauropods. This herbivore is then attacked by the pack of Syntarsis, and a nice detail they included was the enlarged claw on its first finger, similar to Iguanodon that it used for protection by full on punching a Syntarsis to the ground in a way that's almost funny. The distressed Ankysaurus calls to its family and they flee, but the predators give chase. The action is once again briefly broken by an x-ray scene, this time on Ankysaurus, with the narration explaining how animals like it will evolve into the giant sauropods and how its leaf-shaped teeth, long neck and sharp claws are all designed for feeding from branches. This is shortly followed by another x-ray scene for Syntarsis, with the narration explaining how animals like them will evolve into the giant theropods like Allosaurus and T-Rex. It then details how its teeth are designed to grip struggling prey, its wishbone helps make its arms more flexible, and its three-toed feet make them faster runners than herbivores like Ankysaurus. My issue is that this one doesn't explain how this is made possible. I would have liked a bit more detail personally, but it's a minor nitpick. Regardless, the Syntarsis eventually catch up to the herbivore, with the narration stating it was clearly outclassed, which I'm not sure it's referring to the animals generally, or rather just in terms of athleticism. Suddenly, the Syntarsis flee at the sound of probably the coolest dinosaur roar ever. It is now that we are introduced to the real star of the show, the Dilophosaurus. I struggle to put into words how awesome this thing is. The model is a far cry from the iconic but fanciful version seen in Jurassic Park, offering a much more accurate representation which, until very recently, has really stood the test of time. The body is pretty much perfect, it has this really cool metallic texture as well, and all these small scoots on its flanks. The size and proportions all seem correct, and has the correct number of digits, all of which are appropriately sized, and they're non-pronated, which is great. The only issues with this model are on the head, and even these are minor. 
Firstly, it does look a bit shrink-wrapped, with the fenestrae being quite visible. Secondly, it should also probably have lips, like other theropods. Thirdly, the crests are now known to not have been separate structures erupting from the top of the skull as portrayed here, but rather were extensions of it. It's also possible they would be much taller, but this is only speculation. Overall, the Dilophosaurus looks fantastic, and I just have to mention the roar again. It's just that awesome. It has a very ferocious presence in the storyline too. It's clearly the top predator, as it's seen biting and slashing at the Ankysaurus before pulling its dead body to the ground. Speaking of, I swear this shot right here is played again backwards for like a second. Am I crazy? We then see that this Dilophosaurus is a mother, and her offspring seems to have slightly different shaped crests, which is a really cool detail. A rival Dilophosaur appears, and the mother has a kerfuffle with the intruder, and ultimately sees them off. She and her offspring eat their fill, and leave the carcass for later. We then cut to another paleontology segment, once again featuring Dr. Paul E. Olson, this time focusing on dinosaur footprints. He shows us the smaller trackways of Triassic theropods, and compares them to the much larger footprints of theropods, as well as the lack of large reptiles other than dinosaurs from after the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. We then cut back to pre history and see the Syntarsis scavenging the Ankysaurus carcass before being scared off by the returning Dilophosaurus. The narration states that the two are both Ceratosaurs, which at the time was very common to lump many early theropods into Ceratosauria, but are now seen as representing their own distinct lineages on the theropod family tree. It also states that Dilophosaurus is still a primitive dinosaur, which is fairly true, but it states that in the future theropods will lose their fourth digit and crest. This statement is not true for all theropods however, as Ceratosaurs retain the fourth digit and many derived theropods have crests or similar cranial adornments. The early Jurassic segment ends with a narration alluding to both the descendants of dinosaurs like Dilophosaurus and Ankysaurus growing to become enormous. Overall, I like this segment a lot more on review than I remember from my last viewing. The dinosaurs featured in this segment are really well done for the most part, however the glaring issue here is the geography. None of these three animals lived in Pennsylvania. Ankysaurus is known from the nearby states of Connecticut and Massachusetts in the Portland Formation, and Syntarsis and Dilophosaurus are known from Arizona in the Kayenta Formation. I can't help but feel this geographical mishap could have been avoided simply by setting this this segment in Arizona and changing Ankysaurus to the similar basal sauropodomorph from the Kayenta formation, Cerasaurus, which at the time was known as Massospondylus. As I said earlier, the environment isn't bad, but I feel it could have better reflected the ecosystem of early Jurassic North America with a more arid climate, but overall, I enjoyed this part more than I was expecting. The next segment starts in modern day Salt Lake City, Utah which, interestingly, is where they filmed the Salt Lake scene from the Ballad of Big Al. The narration states how the city sits at the foot of the Wasatch mountain range, but 150 million years ago, the mountains didn't exist. Instead, there was a vast, warm savanna covering broad swaths of the North American continent. This is the famous Morrison Formation. In the same vein as the Triassic segment being very similar to New Blood, the Late Jurassic segment is very comparable to Time of the Titans and the previously mentioned Ballad of Bigel from the Walking With series. This part was always my favourite as a kid. Not only is the live action scenery of Argentina beautiful, the storyline is the strongest of all of them, and the creatures here are magnificent. With one exception, but we'll get to that. This story starts in the midst of the dry season. The once lush plains are now arid and barren, except for a few hardy plants. We see various dinosaurs digging for water in a dried up riverbed. One such animal is a mother Dryosaurus and her two offspring. It has a really nice model. It's also really accurate, but perhaps could use some more prominent brow ridges. I much prefer this model over the one seen in the Ballad of Big Al, and the noises they make are pretty cute. The Dryosaurus clan attempt to find water by digging, but to no avail. Unbeknownst to them, they are being stalked by my personal favourite dinosaur, Ceratosaurus. Whilst I am sad that we never got to see it in the Walking With series, the model here looks amazing. Aside from the occasionally pronated wrists and lack of lips, I dare say it is otherwise flawless. The coloration is brown, again, 
but this at least has some nice striping, which is simple but effective. The narration states that it is the last of its kind, when in reality it was actually one of the earlier representatives of Ceratosauria, as this group includes the Abelosaurs and Noosaurs, which survived right up to the end of the Cretaceous. The predator erupts from the trees, and the Dryosaurus have no defence other than to run. One of the juvenile Dryosaurus is slower than the others, and the Ceratosaurus catches, kills and eats the youngster. The mother and her surviving offspring run for the cover of the trees, and inadvertently find a small group of Camarasaurus. I applaud the filmmakers for choosing such a comparatively unimpressive dinosaur to be the main character we follow for this part, as seeing the Morrison from their perspective makes the giant dinosaurs around them just seem even more impressive than they already are. This is made evident by the pair cowering behind the colossal legs of the giant Camarasaurus as the camera slowly pans upwards until it finally reaches the head at the end of its giraffe-like neck. Speaking of the Camarasaurus, the model is pretty good overall. The shrink wrapping is practically non-existent, which is very impressive for the time. The proportions also look to be correct, however there are too many claws on the front feet which should only have the one large claw on the first digit, otherwise this one is excellent. I applaud the filmmakers for choosing it over one of the more famous Morrison sauropods, such as Brachiosaurus for example. We then cut to a paleontology segment at Dinosaur National Monument in Utah with paleontologist Dr. Jim Kirkland. He explains how the monument represents a multi-species dinosaur bone bed around a dried up water source and that the animals were of similar stages of preservation, meaning that they died around the same time. This evidence supports the storyline's validity and its inclusion is greatly appreciated. We then cut back to a wide shot of the Camarasaurus searching the savannah for food with the Dryosaurus in tow. A pair of unidentified pterosaurs fly past and, believe it or not, these are one of only two pterosaur species we see in this film. Based on the long tail, I would be willing to guess it is meant to be Harpactognathus, but other than that there really isn't much to comment on as it only appears for a second or two as a cameo. The small mixed herd reach an oasis of Araucaria and the Camarasaurus dine. We see the Dryosaurus feeding on the fallen needles from the Camarasaurus's reckless browsing. This is followed by an x-ray scene on Camarasaurus. The narration states how this sauropod can hold its neck so high thanks to the strong ligaments in its neck. It also states how they swallow stones called gastroliths to aid in breaking down plant matter. The validity of these stones as genuine gastroliths in sauropods has been questioned recently, however, with some scientists believing they were merely accidentally ingested during feeding, with Camarasaurus in particular seeming to be more well adapted for chewing than other sauropods, thus removing the need for gastroliths. The narration then states how sauropods can ravage forested ecosystems, alluding to huge herds felling countless trees in the near future, but for now we see but a single tree pushed over by a Camarasaurus. The Camarasaurus herd consists of two adults and a juvenile. This is supported by fossil evidence that Camarasaurus travelled in herds or family groups. We are then properly introduced to Stegosaurus. The model is quite good. But what is interesting is that since this film released, Stegosaurus's body plan has been reinterpreted ever so slightly, its proportions having been adjusted to be more in line with other Stegosaur genera. Despite this realisation happening years after its release, this model appears to reflect the newer proportions fairly well, at least in terms of the neck being quite long and the hind limbs not being as monstrously oversized compared to the front legs. It is not perfect, however, as the tail is too short by modern standards and the tail spikes or thagomizers should be pointed more outwards rather than backwards. We see a male and a female scrounging for food. At one point we see one of them rear onto their hind legs to reach for high foliage. There is much debate as to whether stegosaurs could do this and the current thinking seems to suggest they could rear but could not use their tails as a tripod. The pair then encounter the ceratosaurus. The male turns its back to the attacker, swinging his tail and successfully striking it to the ground. The carnivore stands and retreats. How on earth it survived that we may never know. The triumphant male bellows to impress the female and he attempts to mount her, to which she promptly pushes him off. 
Interestingly, we do not see the outdated theory of blood being pumped into the plates like in Walking with Dinosaurs, but rather just them being extravagant display structures. In the next scene, the rains finally arrive, and it's really cool seeing the dinosaurs in a storm at night. Rivers begin to flow once more, and their banks are covered in footprints of all kinds of dinosaurs. The narration also alludes to more than just rain arriving. We then see the first of many gorgeous shots of the herd of Apatosaurus. Followed by John Goodman briefly reminiscing on his former life as Frank Flintstone. The model is fairly good, but there are definitely some issues. For one thing, the front feet have the same issue as the Camarasaurus, in that they should only have one claw. The nostrils are also erroneously placed on top of the head, when they should be at the front of the snout. Sauropod posture is a highly debated topic. Here the Apatosaurus are portrayed with their hips being higher than their shoulders, which is now thought to be inaccurate. More modern reconstructions have the shoulders higher than the hips, with the back sloping more gradually towards the neck, due to the vertebrae over the hips being wedged in such a way that tilts the front of the spine upwards. As such, the neck should also be held higher than what is shown here. The narration also states that a Patasaurus is 12 times heavier than an elephant. Whilst it doesn't specify what species, if we assume it's meant to be an African bush elephant, the heaviest bulls have been recorded weighing anywhere from 6 to 10 tons. With some simple multiplication, we can deduce that around 70 to 120 tons as a weight estimate for a Patasaurus is grossly over-exaggerated, as current estimates place it around a much more conservative 20 tons. Still a hefty beast, all things considered. There is also the possibility that this animal is meant to represent Brontosaurus, which at the time was not a valid genus. Oh, and it's brown. How did I never realise how many of these animals were brown when I was younger? We then cut to another paleontology segment, once again with Dr. Jim Kirkland, describing an extremely complete Camarasaurus and how giant sauropods were abundant in the late Jurassic, yet their eggs have never been found in the Morrison. We then return to Jurassic Utah, with a beautiful shot of the Apatosaurus from beneath a waterfall. The cinematography for this segment is simply superb. The Apatosaurus herd just has such a majestic presence to it. The narration then explains how they feed on low-lying plants by sweeping their long necks in an arc, minimising effort and maximising efficiency. Apatosaurus then has an x-ray segment where the narration explains how there are bands of ligaments attached to its spine that support its long neck and tail, as well as how its neck vertebrae are forked, or bifurcated, that help brace its neck whilst moving it from side to side. We are then introduced to... Oh, God. Allosaurus. So, for the time, it's honestly really accurate, aside from the lack of lips and pronating wrists. But how did they make it so ugly? It's a dull grey with yellow spots, and for some reason, its head is just really wrinkly and unappealing. After an individual has a failed attack on the herd, it then wanders off with the narration alluding to Allosaurus being no quitter. We then see the Dryosaurus pair again, having seemingly ditched their old Camarasaurus bodyguards. They are then promptly ambushed by the Ceratosaurus once more, as if it wasn't bad enough that their ugliest sin. After a brief chase, the Dryosaurus escape when my beloved Ceratosaurus is itself attacked and killed by an Allosaurus with a heartbreaking cry. <sighs> it could be seen as symbolic, as the narration earlier stated that Ceratosaurus was the last of its kind, and that Allosaurus was the most advanced flesh-eater of its day, with the more derived predator beating the more primitive one. And Allosaurus is arguably not the most quote-unquote advanced theropod of the late Jurassic, but rather that distinction would go to the Salurosaurs, but more on them later. As much as it breaks my heart to say this, there is some evidence of Allosaurus feeding on other large theropods, as bite marks have been found on large theropod bones and are seen as evidence of at least scavenging during intense droughts. The fact this attack takes place in the wet season, when herbivore prey is most abundant however, seems quite unlikely. We then return to the Stegosaurus pair. The male has been persistent, which leads to an interesting aspect of Stegosaurus's lifestyle, mating. Here, we see the female laying on her side when the male mounts her. This is considered a likely method of mating, as their large backplates would have been a major obstacle to overcome during copulation. 
At the end of the wet season, we see that the area has once again become arid and devoid of vegetation due to the disruptive feeding of sauropods. As the Apatosaurus herd leaves in search of more food, one trips and falls, bellowing in pain. Unable to get back up, a group of Allosaurus close in for an easy meal. The late Jurassic segment ends with a spectacular shot of the Apatosaurus herd walking off into the sunset. Overall, this is honestly my personal favourite interpretation of the Morrison Formation in Paleomedia. I would honestly place this above both Time of the Titans and The Ballad of Big Al. Whilst I really don't like the Allosaurus, everything else about this segment is simply magnificent and is definitely my favourite of the film. The fourth segment begins in modern-day Albuquerque, New Mexico, what is today an extremely arid place 90 million years ago in the mid-Cretaceous. It was a humid, tropical, forested swampland. The narration explains how rising sea levels created the Western Interior Seaway, an inland sea that split North America into two separate landmasses. Precipitation from this sea fueled the growth of tropical coastal forests that for the first time were home to broadleaf trees alongside the long dominant conifers. The narration then alludes to these forests being home to all new dinosaurs that have never been seen before. After some digging online, I discovered this segment was filmed in Dismal's Canyon in Alabama. It's a really pretty and appropriate filming location for this time and place, which had never been showcased in Paleomedia before. This same distinction also goes to the dinosaurs, the first of which we meet is Zuniceratops, an early ceratopsian that bridges the gap between the more basal forms like Cetacosaurus and the more derived forms like Triceratops. This was my, and I assume many others, introduction to this animal, and really all the dinosaurs featured in this part. It has become a personal favourite dinosaur of mine, and the model has stood the test of time as it is still really accurate to this day. Oh, and it's brown. That's weird. Whilst the narration states they are the first dinosaurs with horns and frills in North America, at the time this was correct. However, more recent discoveries have made this only partly correct. In 2014, a more basal ceratopsian was discovered in Montana named Aquilops that lived around 20 million years earlier. However, this basal ceratopsian lacks horns, so Zuni ceratops is still befitting of this distinction. And now, here's where things get messy. The narration states that predators are now more cunning than ever. From this, we are introduced to two very perplexing animals, small unidentified celurosaurs and unidentified feathered dromaeosaurs, or raptors, the first ever used on film. The reason both of these creatures are unidentified is that neither of them actually exist, except they kind of do? Oh boy. Essentially, these two animals are two different outdated representations of the taxon Susky Tyrannus, a basal tyrannosaur. However, when its fossils were first described in 1998, they were thought to belong to a dromaeosaur, but later were thought to represent a more basal silurosaur. It seems that the filmmakers were unsure which interpretation to go with, so they made two separate models of the same taxon, which are both incorrect. It wasn't until 2019 when the fossils were formally described, identified as a basal tyrannosaur, and given a proper name, Susky Tyrannus, long after production had ended. Because of this convoluted taxonomic mess, it's difficult to judge the accuracy of these models. The raptors have a really accurate head for Susky Tyrannus, but it's attached to the body of a dromaeosaur, sickle claws and all. Likewise, the body proportion of the silurosaurs are good for Susky Tyrannus, but the head is completely fabricated. Maybe if you combine the two, we'd end up with an accurate model. The raptors are pretty creepy. I remember them scaring me a bit when I was younger. Maybe it's because of the whole Frankenstein-esque situation with it being a freakish mix of raptor and tyrannosaur. Hmm, maybe this was what inspired the Indominus Rex. Whilst their bodies are appropriately covered in simplistic filamentous feathers, aka dino fuzz, they should also be present on the hands, and if being reconstructed as a dromaeosaur, they should have full pernicious feathers, forming wings. The tail is also covered in dino fuzz, which is thought to be accurate for a basal tyrannosaur, but a dromaeosaur would have had more of a wide, flat tail fan. This was the early 2000s, however, and feathered dinosaurs were not as well understood as they are now. Whilst most of their feathers are... brown... There is one raptor with a red feather mane. I'm not sure what it is with Paleomedia giving raptors red feathers, but they always seem to look so cool. 
we are introduced to a pack of three raptors feeding on a Zuni Ceratops corpse when the smell of their kill attracts an unwanted scavenger. The pack fiercely defend the carcass, causing the intruder to flee. The following x-ray sequence on the raptors is more of a generic overlook on dromaeosaurs as a whole. The narration explains how muscles in the calf control the killing claw on the second toe. Its legs are strong but lightweight, its tail is stiffened by bony rods for balance, and its arms are long for grasping prey. After escaping the pack, the lone raptor encounters one of the strangest dinosaurs to ever live. It is now that we are introduced to Nothronychus, a therizinosaur that represents a bizarre herbivorous branch of the theropod family tree. I believe this is the first time a therizinosaur has been used in film as well. Please do correct me if I'm wrong. This model has also really stood the test of time, as the feathering on this model is quite accurate, even by modern standards. This might be surprising to hear, but Nothronychus, as well as other large therizinosaurs, may have had fairly sparse feather coverage, as excessive feathering may have led to overheating in hot environments. The proportions are also great, and it even appears to walk on its fourth toe that therizinosaurids were thought to have done. The only issue I can see is some very slight shrink wrapping on the skull, but this really is a nitpick. Overall, the Nothronychus model is excellent. The lone raptor leaps towards the Nothronychus, but the herbivore swipes at him with its powerful arms and sharp claws, sending it flying to the forest floor. The narration states that Nothronychus and Zuniceratops evolved from migrants from Asia. Whilst this is still thought to be true of Ceratopsians like Zuniceratops, the discovery of the basal Therizinosaur, Falcarius, after production concluded, points towards a North American origin for Therizinosaurs after all. We then cut to a paleontology segment with paleontologist Dr. Jim Kirkland and curator Douglas G. Wolfe. They explain how the discovery of Nothronychus helped better the understanding of Therizinosaurs as a whole, showing they were not just restricted to Asia. They then describe the, as of then, unnamed Susky Tyrannus, and how the skull led them to believe it was a dromaeosaur, but the skeleton seemed to more closely resemble a more basal silurosaur. Ironically, Dr. Kirkland's statement about this animal helping our understanding of the classic Cretaceous dinosaurs turned out to be correct, but in a roundabout kind of way. That's paleontology for you. We then cut back to prehistoric New Mexico, where we see two male Zuniceratops rutting for the right to mate with a female. Whilst evidence of rutting isn't known for Zuniceratops specifically, it is known from later Ceratopsids, like Triceratops, so it's possible these more basal forms also partook in this behaviour. The bellowing of these beasts, however, attract the hungry raptor pack. One Zuniceratops sustains an injury to his frill, and he is targeted by the predators. He is then saved by the male he was rutting with, as the herbivore swats the raptor with his horn. The raptors back down, but the narration alludes to them returning and time running out for the injured Zuniceratops. The next scene is rather interesting, as it gives us a proper introduction to the so-called Zuni Silurosaur, with the narration stating that fleet-footed predators are nothing new, but that Silurosaurs are different due to their lighter bones and higher intelligence. The wording here, however, is somewhat misleading. It suggests that Silurosaurs are a new form of dinosaur, whereas they've actually been around since the Jurassic. The fact they state that they have primitive feathers and that it is the body plan of the future further confuses matters, as derived Silurosaurs, such as Archaeopteryx, with fully pinaceous feathers, had been known about for over 100 years and had also lived millions of years prior in the late Jurassic. I would recommend ignoring this part as the information given is just full of holes. In the next scene, we see that a storm is brewing, and that the raptors have been stalking the injured Zuniceratops. Lightning crashes spook the herd, leaving the injured male to his fate. The lightning then ignites a forest fire. The Zuniceratops herd runs from the flames. The raptors, however, just sort of ignore them, and keep eating and burn to death, because... I don't know. After that, rather confusing scene, we cut to a paleontology segment with Dr. Karen Chin, where she explains how there is geological evidence of a forest fire occurring at this time, proving the story is indeed based in fact. Cutting back to prehistoric New Mexico, we see that a Nothronychus is sadly too slow to escape the flames. The narration then alludes to the survivors of this event will lead to the evolution of new dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous. Due to environmental changes, this marks the end of the mid-Cretaceous segment, and this was certainly an interesting one. I have mixed feelings about this part, but more so on the positive side. In a handful of ways, this part is revolutionary amongst paleomedia, as it is the first time any of these creatures have been used in 
in film, and the Zuni Ceratops and Nothronychus are still fantastic. On the other hand, this segment hasn't aged well. The whole Susky Tyrannus fiasco makes watching this part very jarring and confusing nowadays, and the scene with the raptors ignoring the fire because of food is just... what? Overall though, even though the segment has its ups and downs, the good outweighs the questionable. The fifth and final segment begins at Mount Rushmore in modern day South Dakota. The narration alludes to the faces of the president celebrating 200 years of American history, but nearby, even more ancient history lies, the Hell Creek Formation, where some of the last and most famous dinosaurs lived before extinction. This segment can be seen as the equivalent of Death of a Dynasty from Walking with Dinosaurs. The narration then explains how 65 million years ago, the inland sea had retreated, changing both the climate and habitats on the continent. It also states that grass had yet to evolve, and that the plains were covered in small ferns. While correct at the time, new evidence has shown that grass had in fact evolved very late in the Cretaceous, with some evidence indicating grass had evolved even earlier in the Cretaceous. Hell Creek does appear to have been home to fern prairies, however. This final late Cretaceous segment was filmed in Florida, and it really is quite photogenic. The opening shot of the sunrise over the fern prairies is honestly stunning. I like how we also very briefly see some modern creatures, such as birds and spiders, showing how the world is very gradually more closely resembling our modern world. The next shot shows a herd of triceratops, and amongst them is an unnamed theropod. I'm pretty sure this is meant to be either Ornithomimus or Struthiomimus. It appears so briefly it's hard to comment on it, but the model looks very similar to that of the Zuni Salurosaurs, but with slightly longer legs. It's at least covered in feathers, but it appears to lack the pinaceous wing feathers. As for the Triceratops themselves, the skin texture is really detailed and the model does look quite accurate for T. Horridus. However, if this is right before the KPG boundary, it should probably be T. Prorsus. Regardless, the frills of the adults appear to retain their epiparietals and episquamosals, which are the small spikes around the edges of the frill. Whilst these were present in younger individuals, they were resorbed as the animal reached adulthood. The horns look correct to me, and it's hard to see their feet so I can't comment on their fingers and toes. The Triceratops model overall is pretty good. We are then introduced to Anatotitan. This animal is now known as Edmontosaurus anectans, but the model appears to have aged quite well. I was impressed to note that the front feet are correct. This is a common error on hadrosaur reconstructions, where they are given fully separate digits, when in reality, all but the outermost toes were merged as one fleshy pad. Very recent findings on the mummified Edmontosaurus specimen indicate that this pad may have even had a form of hoof. It even has a colour scheme that isn't completely brown, which is nice, with a cool red on the head. We then get a really awesome but brief introduction to the king of the dinosaurs himself, Tyrannosaurus rex. We almost immediately cut away to a paleontology segment with paleontologist Dr. Phil Curry. Here he explains how the retreat of the inland sea had created a continental climate. This favoured larger animals and would explain why many groups of dinosaurs had become so huge at the end of the Cretaceous. Cutting back to prehistoric South Dakota, we are introduced to Quetzalcoatlus. Whilst the model isn't perfect, it is leaps and bounds ahead of walking with dinosaurs rather lazy attempt of recreating this animal. We then immediately get an x-ray scene on the pterosaur, and the narration explains how its wings are made of a skin membrane that stretches from its elongated four fingers to its ankles, yet strangely, the skeleton only seems to show three digits on the hands. It then states that its hollow arm bones are thinner than a postcard, which I'm not fully convinced of honestly. I am happy that it mentions the fibres known as actinofibrils that strengthen the wing membranes. However, the wings do appear to be too pointed at the tips when they should be more rounded. The head looks pretty good, with the crest actually resembling that of Quetzalcoatlus. It is depicted as having a lifestyle similar to that of a vulture, soaring for long distances looking for carrion to scavenge. However, it is now thought that this pterosaur had a lifestyle more comparable to that of a stork, a terrestrial predator of smaller animals. When it lands, its wings fold in from the sides, whereas nowadays it is thought that pterosaurs would have rotated their forelimbs so that their wings folded over the back. We then see a herd of triceratops, with individuals of various ages. Triceratops, however, is thought to have only lived in smaller herds, if not solitarily. The herd is then suddenly ambushed by a young T-Rex. The Triceratops encircle their young, which has been a long-standing trope in Paleomedia, but there's no real evidence for this behaviour. We then get our first good look at the Tyrannosaurus model, 
and I think it's one of the better ones in Paleo Media. Whilst it has the typical theropod problem of pronated wrists, there is currently some debate on whether Tyrannosaurus did truly have lips. As such, I'll avoid commenting on this. The head shape is excellent, as are the proportions. I like that we see Tyrannosaurus at different growth stages, and how their morphology changes with age. As such, the teenage Tyrannosaurus is portrayed as incredibly fast, whereas they would become considerably slower with age. Even still, this carnivore wasn't fast enough to catch the Quetzalcoatlus. After sunset, we see the young T-Rex return to its family in the forest. Here, Tyrannosaurus is portrayed as living in family groups and hunting cooperatively. This behaviour has been questioned recently, however, with some believing Tyrannosaurus to be a solitary hunter. We then get an x-ray scene on Tyrannosaurus, with the narration stating how its skull and teeth are designed to slice meat and crush bone. The other facts, however, are fairly bland and simply explain that it has small arms but a strong body and legs. We then transition to another paleontology segment with Dr. Phil Curry explaining how juvenile Tyrannosaurs were built differently to the adults, possessing longer legs and were probably much faster, providing credibility to this segment's storyline. The theory of them being pack hunters, however, has since been questioned. Cutting back to prehistoric South Dakota, we get some insightful narration, seldom seen in documentaries like this. It states how, in nature, the moments of terror are rare amidst the countless peaceful and boring hours, and I really like this inclusion. We then see a herd of Anata Titan, with the narration stating they have really acute senses. I can't seem to find any evidence of this, so please do let me know of any research on this in the comments. We then get an x-ray scene on a Nata Titan. The narration states how their muscles are toothless, but they have batteries of hundreds of grinding teeth further back in their mouths for cropping vegetation. However, they are portrayed as chewing with a side-to-side -side motion, whereas more recent research suggests a front-to-back method of chewing to be more likely. Herding behaviour in hadrosaurs, but also at Montsaurus specifically, is supported by the fossil record, so the narration stating they cling to each other is not unfounded. The herd, however, is being stored by the T-Rex family. The swift younger carnivores chase down an unlucky Anata Titan for their mother to deliver the killing blow. We then come to the end of the Age of Dinosaurs as the meteorite strikes the Gulf of Mexico, sending an enormous cloud of vaporized rock across the earth. We then see an awesome scene of the blast front approaching the forest. A wall of fire scorches everything in its path and it looks incredible. The last of the dinosaurs run in vain, but they ultimately succumb to their fate. We then see the ensuing impact winter and the devastation it has caused. This extinction scene honestly puts the one from walking with dinosaurs to shame. We then cut to one final paleontology segment with Dr. Phil Curry, explaining the most likely theory for the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs being a meteorite impact. We see footage of modern animals who can trace their ancestry back to survivors of the Cretaceous extinction before seeing a brief montage of the dinosaurs seen throughout the film. The following narration is simply incredible. It's unlikely anything so huge or captivating will ever pass this way again followed by a pair of the mammal Purgatorius, a possible ancestor of primates live acted by opossums climbing on a T-Rex skull. One day, their children will walk on the moon and think back in awe to a time when dinosaurs roamed America. Roll credits. Wow. What a spectacular note to go out on. So, in conclusion, When Dinosaurs Roamed America was one of my favourite paleo documentaries as a kid, and that hasn't changed. Whilst it does have a small handful of shortcomings in terms of accuracy and an overwhelmingly bland colour palette when it comes to the creature models, I thoroughly enjoyed the storytelling, the visuals, the music, and John Goodman's fantastic narration. Some may see it as a cheaper knockoff of Walking with Dinosaurs, and at times it can feel a bit like that, but truth be told, in in some ways, I think this film is on par with, and sometimes even exceeds, Walking with Dinosaurs in terms of quality and enjoyment. All in all, this is easily one of the best paleontology documentaries ever made, even 20 years later. If you're a paleontology buff and haven't seen it, do yourself a favour and check it out. Oh, and for those wondering about my thoughts on Valley of the T-Rex, a documentary that uses the same CGI to portray T-Rex as Jack Horner's proposed giant scavenger, just go watch 
Rick Kreptor's video on it. My thoughts are basically the same as his, and the video is really funny. Thank you so much for watching this video. It took a lot longer to make, and ended up being a lot longer than I intended, but there was just so much to say. Regardless, thank you so much for watching, and please do check out the review of a figure based on a dinosaur that appeared in this movie. So I'll see you guys in that video. Thank you. Bye-bye now.